where we're going to talk about the lethal recipe, which has quite a dramatic name. And it really came about because I started to realize a trend in how ingredients were processed. And this started way back when I was a chef, and I started to look at uh, On Food and Cooking by Harold McGee and how sugar was actually produced. And I was really um, blown away at how many processes cane juice or beet juice went through, sugar beets went through, to then become refined sugar. And a few years um, later, much later, for some reason, I just had this idea in my head and I started to make the connection between how um, highly addictive drugs were made. So things like opium um, turned into heroin, uh, coca leaves turned into cocaine, and I started to notice there was a similar kind of process. And it led me to realize that how we process ingredients, even if they're natural to begin with, totally affects how they affect the body. And you can take something that has a lovely, naturally occurring kind of opiate effect in the body that gives you a little bit of a lift, you know, um, very similar to a cup of coffee, and you can take it into something that is a highly addictive and toxic drug. And when you start to do this with a series of ingredients and you put them in all the food on the planet, or almost all of it, you notice a trend that every country that adopts this lethal recipe and way of processing things and putting it into their food, the incidence so their lifestyle diseases starts to escalate dramatically. So if you saw in the introductory webinar the uh, slides from the Center of Disease Control, the obesity slides that I used from 85 to 2000, you can see this massive trajectory in how people started to become obese. Now we know that for something to happen in that short period of time, that it cannot just be some kind of genetic anomaly that is definitely lifestyle conditions. And if you look at you know, other um, statistics of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, all these other diseases, they start to escalate in any country that starts to import and use this lethal recipe. And we see it's not just aged people that are affected, children are being affected. And now we realize that there's the recent kind of statistic that came out that the children of this generation will not outlive their parents based on continuing to live like this. And there are children as young as five and six that are having hardened arteries like you would actually have seen in a senior citizen many, many years ago. And this illustration um, I came up with um, basically based on that. And it says, what we, fill a ch what we fill our children's bodies with affects how they think, how they feel, how they behave, and it affects who they are, and it potentially can definitely affect who they become. So when you put life-giving, nutrient-rich foods into children, we notice that they have these calm, kind of even dispositions. They learn effectively. And when we start to put in the lethal recipe, we get things like AD. Um, we get uh, hyperactivity, uh, serious learning disabilities that can actually just be reversed if they're caught in time by feeding them highly nourishing, energizing, protective food. So this is something that we need to address now because it is massively impacting our children's future, their, the potential for longevity and, and living. I like to make a little joke about the food that we're eating. I call it Star Trek food, you know. Food. It's food, Jim, but not as we know it. So some of this food is designed to live indefinitely um, out in space and have nothing living in it, so nothing can actually grow in it, so it'll never go off. And we kind of notice that it may never break down in its solid state. Um, and in fact, we're finding that the human body is not breaking down, decomposing uh, as quickly as it once did because there's so many preservatives. And when we eat a food, it doesn't just go through us. We can find it actually not just um, in our um, uh, different body parts, but in fact uh, different cells. All our cells can actually be filled with these foods. So things like corn, they're finding that Americans who have corn is a significant ingredient in most of their foods. A large part of their DNA is actually can genetically be composed of the same uh, contents of corn. And when you think about it, the food we eat is actually the building blocks for the cells we create in our body. And so if you're putting in junk materials, you're going to end up with a junk construction. And uh, the ability for it to withstand uh, pressure, uh, disease, stress is going to be a lot less. So it's really important we identify what is the lethal recipe. And it's not always just the things we often assume it is. We think we know if we're going through a drive through we're pretty much guaranteed. Or we're stopping at a corner store that it's pretty much guaranteed going to be the lethal recipe. But there are lots of things that are actually marketed as healthy that in fact are the lethal recipe and we're starting to see the results of it. So um, this is one of my kind of uh, 
sarcastic drawings, I think, <laughs> tongue in cheek, um, of looking at the state obesity and basically um, the Statue of Liberty, which stood for all these wonderful things uh, in our um, the society that we're living in now, is actually turning into a, a toxic recipe and is not actually leading us ultimately to freedom. These foods we often think of as convenient, fast, and easy, and will lead us to freedom are actually enslaving us into a lifestyle of disease and lethargy and sadness. And we're seeing that with teens, again, this is the average teenager is eating over 100 pounds of sugar. Uh, over a hundred years ago that would have been around one to two pounds of sugar and now we're seeing a massive massive increase and along with that are tons of chemicals. So these beautiful teenagers that have their full lives ahead of them um, who are you know entering into university or, or you know if they don't have those opportunities are going into into jobs when they're doing that from a malnourished state, there's a great deal of anxiety and depression and increased levels of stress when their body doesn't have the nutrients it needs to actually nourish it. So getting right down to what is the cause of the lethal recipe is basically looking at how our, our foods are processed. It's very similar to how we take opium sap and we turn it into heroin. Okay, so if you think about it, opium sap in its natural state is a naturally occurring ingredient. It has vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients in it. It also has opiates in it. Um, but so do lots of foods. So lettuces actually have opiates in it. Grains have opiates in it. Dairy has opiates in it. So opiates aren't this evil, horrible thing. In fact, in milk, the baby actually suckles and it's a protective mechanism to keep the baby from eating, not just for nutrients, but it keeps it slightly addictive so it gets this feeling of well-being so it's not just wanting to be fed, it's wanting to get this little kind of drug-like intoxication and that's why when you see babies after they had their, you know, their breast feed and they're, had their, they've got this little bit of a milky high and, and they're in bliss. So what happens is we have opiates and lots of food and in their natural state your body can actually deal with them and eliminate them. So. Um, Traditionally, at funerals in Iran, they actually take opium sap, not all of them, <laughs> I'm guessing, but um, they take the opium sap, they dry it, they powder it, and they sprinkle it into teas, and it helps people cope with the grieving process, but it's not highly addictive or toxic to the body, but it has, it has that, um, that drug-like intoxication on a, on a very minor level. What we've discovered as humans is if we actually take things with opiates in it and we start to process it using very specific methods, that it increases that drug-like intoxication. So what they do to actually take um, opium sap and make opium from it is they actually cook it in a big cauldron and they start to cook it and add liquids and the heat starts to denature the compounds in it. And so they skim off the top the macro and micronutrients. Now when we refer to this as the refining process, when we're making sugar, um, we often will, um, or gold, you know, if we're actually refining um, metals, um, uh, we will actually refer to that as the impurities, taking the impurities off. Same with you making a stock. But what those actually are in, in the food sense is they're macro and micronutrients. So they're things that are nourishing um, or uh, protective or energizing um, or just basic minerals that meet our body's needs. So when we take that off, we change the molecular structure with the heat and often they'll use toxic chemicals. So they create this brown-like substance, opium which is addictive and toxic to the body. Now, if you think about the same correlation between sugars and the oils and lots of other things that they make this way, which I'll talk about, um, that's the process. They're taking out those micro macronutrients and the protective compounds in it. So you've got this addictive toxic substance that's brown. Think about brown sugar. So if you take sugar from its cane juice state and you just dehydrate it, well, it's a little bit different than that, but what we normally refer to as brown sugar um, uh, or raw sugar has some, some macro and micronutrients in it, but it's crystalline. Once it becomes crystallized, you know a lot of the nutrients have taken out and its structure has changed significantly. So a lot of brown sugar that's in the supermarket is actually refined sugar that's had molasses put on it. So it looks like brown sugar, but it's not at that stage. And it's just as addictive as refined white sugar. Okay, so if you actually take the opium from that stage and instead of crystallizing it, you actually process it further, removing more macro and micronutrients using different heat treatments and cutting it with toxic chemicals, you can end up with a pure white substance. Same thing happens with sugars and oils, salts and grains, and many chemicals that are actually in our food. And it's not just these 
five primary ingredients, but if you took refined sugars, refined oils, refined grains, and refined salts, and refined chemicals, out of the human diet, so you couldn't possibly source anything in a normal supermarket with any of those things in there, you barely have a handful of ingredients left that you could source. So what does this mean for the human body? Well, when you have a substance that has all the macro and micronutrients and the protective qualities removed, you end up with the pure white substance. They call it refined, and refined is great for your car when it comes to oils, but not so good for the human body because the human body thrives on those macro and micronutrients. So you can actually eat something that has refined sugars, oils, salts, um, grains, and chemicals in it. So the donut's kind of like the poster child for the lethal, lethal recipe. Um, and you can eat tons of those things. And although you're eating lots of things that in a natural environment would have given you nutrients, now you're eating it and it has no, um, it doesn't have any of those macro and micronutrients that nourish, energize, and protect the body. So what happens is you can eat a volume of food and you, even though your belly is full, your satiety cue has not been shut off because your body's saying, I'm not getting what I need, feed me more. Okay, so that's what starts the cycle of addiction. Then you also get this rush of the opiates, the increased uh, drug-like reactions from the opiates and the sugars, um, there's opiates in the grains again, all those things, so you get this high and then what happens is you get the low and when you're in the low um, you get wacky things that happen with your blood sugars and your body's kind of in, in survival mode of trying to repair and, and, and take care of itself and you're feeling down here low and you're malnourished. And so the body says, feed me something more because I'm not getting what I need and I feel terrible. And we're down in this low of this corresponding kind of, this low, we're seeking something that's going to give us a corresponding high. So we don't usually seek something that levels us out. So when we're feeling kind of grumpy and agitated because we've just eaten this takeaway or drive through kind of meal, and we're getting coming down from the low, we don't go, oh man, you know what I need? I just need a big roll of raw broccoli, right? <laughs> no, we don't do that. Um, we tend to go for something that gives us another high, and we start this vicious cycle. And you do this enough, and you're not getting nutrients from your body, and it's literally a recipe, um, a lethal recipe for disease, and it's just a matter of time. It's not when you'll get sick. Uh, sorry, if you'll get sick, it's when you'll get sick. And so we see the cultures that are actually importing this recipe are importing disease at an alarming rate. So if you just look at this illustration, the poppy sap, opium crystals, then into pure heroin. We look at fresh cane juice, whole cane sugar, um, or like now uh, what's really popular is um, coconut palm sugar, and then pure refined sugar. You see, if you've ever had a glass of cane juice, in a natural environment, like when I used to live in Australia and I'd travel up to Queensland, they'd have these presses where they'd be pushing the cane through. Something you could not do by hand, by the way. That's massive machinery actually expresses the cane juice. Um, you can hardly finish a glass. It's sweet. It's not like intensely overly sweet, but it's, it's definitely sweet. It's not easy, in my opinion, and I have a sweet tooth, to finish a glass of cane juice. But the thing is, is you don't crave like massive amounts. It'd be almost impossible to drink two liters of it unless you were seriously malnourished, and even then it's probably not a wise thing to do. Um, because there's nutrients in it, the body, the satiety cues are actually shut off in our body by nourishment, not by volume of food, okay? Our stom stomachs, when we eat too much food, stop eating because we reach a point of discomfort. But if we actually start to listen to our bodies, the satiety cue actually shuts off when we are nourished or satiated when we're nourished. We're satiated when we're nourished, okay? So if you think about it, refined sugar, um, if you go back to the work of uh, Weston A. Price when he was looking at traditional cultures, um, and in the book, I believe it's Sugar Blues, there was this st story about um, uh, Banting, Frederick Banting, the fellow who developed or um, discovered insulin. What he discovered was the plantation owners that had access to refined sugar had lots of dental caries and um, have diabetic or pre-diabetic symptoms. But the plantation workers who didn't have access because they couldn't afford refined sugar, the children would actually chew on the cane um, all day and they'd have beautiful teeth that weren't um, filled with cavities, right? Because the sugar had tons of nutrients in it. It wasn't highly refined. And they, so they had great teeth and they had um, very little to no incidence of diabetes, whereas the children and the plantation owners who had access to refined sugar, tons of dental caries and tons of uh, uh, diabetes was rife. 
And basically, so we're seeing that dental caries are not just a matter of oral hygiene, but something systemic within the body as far as being nourished. Okay, so if we look at cultures that start to um, take their natural ingredients and process them, again, we see this change um, where as soon as uh, what we refer to as you know, poorer people who would not have access to the fine sugar, once they do get it, and particularly if they get it right away and there hasn't been like a slow introduction, we see a massive increase in sugar addiction and the lifestyle diseases that ensue from that. And if you, so if you look at this illustration, you'll see that there's a similar kind of process with the sugars, flours, salts, oils, grains, and then we can even go into soy. Um, any food in its natural state will have nutrients in it. But as we process it and refine it and change it and put chemicals in it, we turn it into a lethal recipe ingredient. And the more of these things in our food, um, our disease and um, addiction rates are accelerated. So if you look at oils, there's a great book called Fats That Harm, Fats That Kill, or Fats That Heal, Fats That Kill by Udo Rasmus. And basically he was actually showing us the process of how oils were made. And um, so initially, um, when, a, when a seed or a nut cake comes in, in order to extract it from the seed, um, if it can't be pressed by hand, um, what they will, or expel or expressed, what they will do is they'll use heptane and hexane to um, actually, uh, it's a solvent extraction stage, so they actually get the oil from the seed nut cake. But what they do before that is they'll actually cook the seeds or the nuts or whatever substance they're using um, to 240 degrees Celsius. And we know heat will denature fats rapidly and um, create them to um, break down and become uh, oxidized, okay? So then it goes to a stage of degumming. So you can see from the original um, illustrations that I have from uh, my little return to food book which was then called Nature's Principle. Um, a little uh, illustration of the degumming stage was where they removed the phospholipids. Now the phospholipids are the phytonutrients, the naturally occurring um, plant um, nutrients that actually nourish, energize and protect and can actually lower your blood pressure. Why would they take those nutrients out? Well the only reason they would take them out is because they are the things that the living things will also spoil most readily. So if they're going to keep an oil on a shelf for a year to two years or three years without oxidizing they need to remove those otherwise they will go off okay um, so then it goes to a stage oh the degumming stage when they they use um, phosphoric acid which is a highly corrosive substance that if you actually put it on your hand um, it will burn a hole through your hand so this is something that's coming in contact with your oils in addition to heptane and hexane Okay, then it goes to um, a refining stage where they mix the oil with sodium hydroxide. So for those of you who don't know what sodium hydroxide is, it's actually the active ingredient that they use in Drano, which is caustic soda. Okay, so, um, and that's basically, um, they mix the oil with that. Not so nice. Uh, and then it goes through a bleaching stage where filters and acid-treated activated clays are used to remove any colors and aromas. Okay, um, and flavors. And then it goes to a deodorizing stage where they um, heat the oil again to 240 to 270 degrees, uh, which again is going to add another level of denaturing and changing the structure of the oil. Okay, and then a, a, a final preservation stage where essentially these dead oils are further treated by a whole host of synthetic antioxidants such as butylated um, hydroxytuolene, propyl gallate, terroir, brithoquinone, methicillicone, and there are more. And then a final stage um, is they add a defomer. Because if you think about it, if you've ever made soap from oils, um, it requires a lot of processes and then it creates the soap consistency. And because these oils are so overly processed, they add a defomer so that you can't literally shake up your oil and make soap with it. So it's really kind of nuts, and if you want to learn about um, making margarine, it goes um, even further into um, highly processes, highly crazy things that they use. Again, deodorizing it, um, using things like nickel and aluminum as a catalyst, along um, with the hydrogenation uh, process. So, and then they use um, colorings and flavorings and emulsifiers, and it's just nuts. So. You definitely want to be avoiding these things. They ain't good. So there's an expression um, in Australia, there was a car commercial that used to say, oils ain't oils, um, meaning that these 
oils for your car. Not all of them are created equally and what you want for your car is a highly refined oil. Whereas that might work well for your car, that does not work for the body. Okay, so the lethal recipe is really um, potentially kind of the, the concept that I use to help people really understand what is happening to their food and it has the potential to kind of be the biggest wake-up call for people. The other ones work a little bit more on a subtle level, but the lethal recipe is, it's pretty basic and it's um, to actually explain to people, but if you can just kind of take them through and help them understand there's all these different processes that actually happen to our food and the further away from nature each process takes it, the less, less nourishing, energizing, and protective the food is and the most likely harmful we um, the food is and what happens too is that because of that we become more vulnerable to disease because one of the big things that, that's removed consistently is the phytonutrients, these naturally occurring um, aromas, colors, and flavors in foods, okay? When I first started studying nutrition all those years ago, if, you, if I told anyone that they were the most powerful substances against, you know, that humans know of to protect us against disease, I would have been considered a quack, right? Um, but now they've categorized tens of thousands of these naturally occurring plant chemicals, and they have been affirmed and confirmed as being the most protective substances uh, to protect us against disease. So you start to remove those from the food system sy symptomatically and you will see um, the disease rates increase because our kind of our protective powers have been uh, removed from our food. So we really need to get back to foods eating that and we need to move away from the lethal recipe because it is toxic, addictive, um, and won't protect us against disease. In fact, make us vulnerable to it. Okay, so the activity for this module is to start to go to your cupboards and to pull out all the items that, create, uh, that include even one ingredient that could be considered a lethal recipe ingredient, okay? So often we, we like to think of in the kind of, we moved away from the calorie um, concept that we don't count calories because basically if you eat in context of nature, the calorie thing will all sort itself out. And now um, we have tons of food and chemicals and most people know that we're not meant to be eating chemicals. But the problem is, is that it's not the only thing. You can ha actually have things that are called natural colors, natural flavors. Um, you can have things, you know, that have one ingredient in it called stevia, right? But it can still be highly refined. So you want to start to look for the substances in your food that aren't made naturally. You want to start to look for companies that really understand this lethal recipe and are really moving away from it and really producing their um, food with knowledge about what's going into it and integrity. Okay, so we're looking in our cupboards for anything with processed white ingredients, so that includes even white stevia, so unless the stevia is green, it's highly processed. Um, there's another xylitol, um, another sugar that's made from wood alcohol, which is, it might have a lower um, effect on your glycemic index, but this stuff is highly processed with toxic chemicals, same thing. And we would never in nature be eating the sugar from a, a tree, and if we were, we would be eating it in a natural way, not through all those processes. Okay, so start to look at the ingredients and really question and understand what's in there. And um, down the track um, in, the, in the program, we're actually going to be going through, when we do a kitchen audit, how to identify and what to do with it. And I'm going to talk also about the replace principle, so you're not just throwing out masses of things um, and shocking your budget. Although, if you're a type A personality, you may want to do that. But there are ways to actually integrate this information gracefully into your life. Um, one of the things you can actually do is to take a picture of all the things that you think are suspect. Um, and let people know that they're on their way out of the kitchen and if they ask you why, you can actually then start to explain. And really, people who love learning know that one of the best, way, best ways to learn is to teach. So as you start to create a conversation around this um, and talk using sensational words like the lethal recipe, it gets people a, a gets people's attention. And if you're throwing out something that people would not normally think is healthy, like most people think that white stevia is actually good for you and it's a good alternative to sugar, and even though you're using less, it's still not great to be using and processing, it starts a conversation and then you can then start to inform and explain to other people how these things are made and maybe why they should or should not be eating them for optimal health. Okay, try not to should on them, but um, 
it's, and we'll talk a little bit about that too um, further in the program, but powerful language and how we can actually use words um, to really help people make these shifts faster. So um, yes, yeah, so go to the um, Facebook page, the Return to Food Facebook page, um, take out any pictures of any of your ingredients, share what you've learned, um, and also some insights that you may have that I haven't already put up here do feel free to share them on the Facebook page. The next module we're going to be covering is the consumption concept, which is a pretty cool concept that I gave a TED Talk on, and I'll look forward to sharing that with you. So, see ya.